Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And in this lecture, we're going to learn why it's a bad idea to mix your mercury with your opium, why you really shouldn't fear someone who can do a double somersault, a new and terrible gun, 12,000 pardons, and we're going to ask the question that, in the end, did they betray the legacy of Abraham Lincoln? We're going to follow that outline right up above my little yellow box as we arrive at the last part of this lecture, the part that finally asks the question, the Civil War triumph or tragedy. It is the end of the year 1864, and the South is on the verge of complete defeat. Two of its three great armies have been annihilated in the field, leaving only Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia guarding the great Confederate capital at Richmond. The election of 1864 has come and gone, and Abraham Lincoln has handily won re-election, although he is saddled with a very strange man, Andrew Johnson, as his vice president, a pro-Union Southerner from Tennessee who is very, very, very sympathetic to the Confederate rebels farther south. And farther south, William Tecumseh Sherman has spent the end of the year making Georgia howl tearing his way, tearing a path of death and destruction across the southern states. And in the new year, he will turn north and he will bring total war to the heart of rebellion. He will bring total war to South Carolina, the state that started the Civil War in the first place and the state that has consistently defended American slavery for the entirety of his existence. And his forces move into South Carolina and his outriders near the plantation of James Henry Hammond, the self-proclaimed Thomas Jefferson of the Confederacy, the man who wrote the pro-slavery argument, the man who developed the mud seal theory. He is caught at his home in Radcliffe Plantation. He knows that Sherman's forces are nearby, and rather than risk capture, rather than risk trial, James Henry Hammond takes a massive dose of opium mixed with mercury. It is a lethal dose, and James Henry Hammond passes from this earth. Sherman moves his force across South Carolina. He moves it into the state capital of Columbia, which attempts to resist him, and he burns that city to the ground. He burns homes, shops, businesses, factories, railroads, shoots cattle, slaughters hogs, burns crops, tears up railroads, blows up bridges. He brings total war to the heart of South Carolina. Absolutely terrified, the city of Charleston, which fired the first shot in the Civil War, universally surrenders. It sends a message to Sherman that says, we give up, you, you don't have to come fight a battle with us, you don't need to bring total war here, we, we completely surrender. We completely and totally and utterly surrender. And Sherman agrees to their terms of surrender. The remaining Confederates will either lay down their arms and be taken into custody, or they will flee north in, a, in an attempt to maybe link up with Lee uh, farther up in Virginia. And they will throw open the gates of the city, and they will allow two infantry regiments to occupy the city of Charleston. Sherman agrees to this, and he sends two regiments into Charleston. But this is where Sherman reveals his real wit. He sends to the heart of American slavery, the place that started the Civil War, the place that was founded on the concept of slavery, founded by you know, immigrants from Barbados. Sherman sends two regiments of African-American soldiers to liberate the heart of slavery. And here's an illustration of their entry into the city. February 21st, 1865, and as the African-American soldiers enter the city, the entire city explodes in jubilation. Slavery has ceased to exist in the heart of slavery. There is a wild party in the streets. The soldiers can barely keep their composure. Now, from the beginning, the city fathers of South Carolina, the city fathers of Charleston, had always feared a great slave rebellion where black men with guns would rise up and destroy the institution of American slavery. And it turns out they were correct to fear this because that's ultimately what happened in the end. 
they did destroy American slavery. They did arrive in the city. But, they, but these African-American men arrived in a manner that nobody in South Carolina would have ever expected. They arrived in the army uniforms they wore, marching under the flag of the United States. And this raises a more interesting question. Who actually freed the slaves? And you hear this in history all the time. Oh, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. He's the great emancipator. Oh, it was the North that freed the slaves. The Union freed the slaves. The Republicans freed the slaves. I will actually disagree with all of those statements. Who freed the slaves? Through honorable military service and unconquerable valor, the slaves freed themselves. And you can see this. All of these former slaves absolutely loved getting their pictures taken with their pistols in uniform. They were very very proud to serve. And even when the African-American population in Charleston absolutely went nuts, the soldiers kept their composure and stayed in marching file. In the end, the slaves freed themselves. But it was not a trouble-free existence. We're going to rewind the clock about six months. Sometimes terrible terrible things happened. And one of those really terrible things happened at a place called Fort Pillow. Now, Fort Pillow was a garrison that was made up of about 600 soldiers. You had 300 white and 300 black soldiers. And Fort Pillow was not expecting any trouble. There wasn't supposed to be a Confederate army for, you know, 100 miles, when suddenly a Confederate army appears directly on top of them. And this wasn't just any Confederate army. It was the cavalry army led by Nathan Bedford Forrest. Nathan Bedford Forrest was an absolutely terrifying and ferocious Confederate general, one of the greatest cavalry commanders that ever existed, a man known for his brutality, for his savagery. Nathan Bedford Forrest, when total war broke out, Nathan Bedford Forrest took his cavalry into Ohio. He said, I'm going to bring total war to the north. And he left his own trail of death and destruction across that northern state. But on this day, on April 12th, 1864, Nathan Bedford Forrest tears into Fort Pillow. The garrison is completely surprised. They're overwhelmed, and they surrender. They weren't expecting this. They were taken by surprise. They weren't expecting to fight a major battle, and they've been captured by the Confederates. And in the tumult, in the chaos, maybe he ordered it, maybe he didn't, Nathan Bedford Forrest murders 300 African-American soldiers at Fort Pillow. This goes down in Civil War history as the Fort Pillow Massacre. It is a war crime by any measure. And Nathan Bedford Forrest rides off, and the entire country is shocked at the brutality, at the murder of these 300 American soldiers. And many people vow to track down Nathan Bedford Forrest. But we're going to move our attention to the east, to the Army of the Potomac and its new commander, Ulysses S. Grant. Grant arrives and takes command of the Army of the Potomac in March of 1864. And as he begins to assess his brand new army, where the artillery is, what the infantry regiments look like, where the cavalry is, what kind of reserves, what kind of logistics are being set up, all of these subordinate lesser generals who have been fighting Lee for years tell him, oh, we have to do this, we have to watch out for that, we can't use this plan because if Lee attacks here and then attacks there at the same time, we won't know what to do. And what Grant hears is a lot of defeatism. These people have simply been beaten down by losing so many battles to Robert E. Lee over the years. And finally, Grant loses his temper. He says, oh, I am heartily tired about hearing about what Lee is going to do. Some of you seem to think he is going to turn a double somersault and land in our rear and both flanks at the same time. Go back to your command and try to think about what we are going to do instead of what Lee is going to do. Because Grant has a strategy for beating Robert E. Lee, and he puts this strategy into effect in a series of battles that become known as the Overland Campaign. These are a series of 
14 battles fought in six weeks between May and June of 1864. Grant leads this huge army. It's more than twice the size of Lee's army. Grant leads this huge army south and smashes directly into Robert E. Lee. They fight a terrible battle at a place called the Wilderness. Grant puts his army back up and attacks again. They fight a battle at Spotsylvania, at Hanover Junction, at Cold Harbor, at Chickahominy. Grant attacks and attacks and attacks and attacks. They fight a major battle every three days. And the thing is, Robert E. Lee wins almost every battle. Grant attacks him and is repelled. Lee, Lee has to pull back to save his army, and Grant attacks him again. Lee has to pull back to save his army, and Grant attacks him again. Grant is losing two Union soldiers for every one rebel he kills, and Grant is completely okay with that. The goal of the Overland Campaign is not to capture Richmond. The goal of the Overland Campaign is not to defeat Robert E. Lee. The goal of the Overland Campaign, the strategy that Grant accepted on, was to kill as many rebel soldiers as he could, regardless of how many casualties it cost the North. And Grant leaves a trail of bodies across Northern Virginia and is incredibly eerie because some of these battles take place inside Lee's great victories from previous years. Soldiers will go to dig foxholes or dig rifle pits and suddenly uncover the bones of dead Union soldiers who died at Fredericksburg or who died at Chancellorsville. The soldiers that Grant takes with him are subjected to unimaginable horrors. And Lee cannot react to this type of strategy. He has no idea how to handle an enemy that attacks him and doesn't care about casualties. Lee's army just reels from it. I mean, again, he wins every battle, but he has to pull back to save his ever shrinking, ever dying army. And Grant chases him all the way down from the Potomac River all the way to Richmond, wrapping it around until he, Lee arrives at a place called Petersburg. And Petersburg is the main rail junction for Richmond. You can't retreat anymore past Petersburg. So Lee spreads his army between Richmond and Petersburg and digs in. And Grant responds by spreading the army of the Potomac around the same fortifications and digging in himself. And the result is going to be a huge battle that lasts nine long slow months. It's generally called the Siege of Petersburg, but it's basically World War I style combat. You've got all the hallmarks of World War II trench warfare. Trenches, barbicans, artillery duels, snipers, uh, night attacks, all of a uh, no man's land, all of these terrible things take place in the nine months of the Siege of Petersburg where Lee's army is spread out between Petersburg and Richmond. And the Army of the Potomac, commanded by Grant, slowly just starts wrapping itself around it. And this is exactly the type of battle that Grant excels at. Slow, you dig in, you bring up the heavy artillery, you launch small, intense little fights to seize 10 or 20, or if you're lucky, 500 feet of enemy trench. And they start slowly squeezing the Army of Northern Virginia. And Lee has nothing to do. Lee cannot escape the trap of Petersburg. He can't do any of his fancy maneuvers where he floats around and moves like lightning across the landscape. None of that works on Grant. But this is the type of battle Grant knows how to fight. That's the type of battle he fought at Vicksburg. It's the type of battle he fought all the way back at Fort Henry. Grant simply proceeds to wrap around Lee's army and tighten the vice, slowly and inexorably cracking and crushing it. And at Petersburg, a new and terrible gun appears. And it appears right, it doesn't appear in large numbers. There's only a handful of them appear uh, during this long, slow battle at Petersburg. But where they do appear, they are absolutely a terrifying new weapon. And the, the rebels just can't even believe what they're looking at when these terrible new guns open up on them. 
because you see this new gun had been invented. The South is, again, not just being outnumbered and outproduced. It's being out-invented. And an inventor in the North named Dr. Richard Gatling had invented an incredibly new type of firearm. And in fact, the way that this gun worked is that, you know, again, I think I'll just show you uh, rather than attempt to explain it myself. And this gun was called Gatling's Gun. Depending on how fast you load it and cranked it, it could go between 300 and 600 rounds a minute. A terrifying new weapon. And Lee's army simply begins to disintegrate. He's not getting reinforcements from Georgia or the Carolinas because they're being ripped apart by William Sherman. He can't get beef from Texas because the Mississippi has been cut off. He's running out of ammunition. His soldiers are dying in these mud-filled trenches. Their shoes are rotting off their feet. Their uniforms are falling apart. They're, they're running out of guns. They're running out of ammunition. Some of his cannons go silent because he just doesn't have gunpowder to load on them. And the gunpowder and the steel was, gonna, was coming from the big factories in Birmingham, Alabama. That's been cut off. The Army of Northern Virginia is dying in the trenches of Petersburg exactly the way Grant wants it to. Lee has to make a decision. If he stays at Petersburg, the army dies. But if he leaves Petersburg, Richmond falls. Lee has to make a choice between the Confederate capital and the Army of Northern Virginia. And Lee typically chooses his army. On the night of April 2nd, the rebel trenches go silent and the Army of Virginia attempts to run. The next day, the Army of the Potomac enters the capital of the Confederacy. Richmond has fallen to the Union Army. The Union Army marches triumphantly through its battered and shell-shocked streets, and just like in Charleston, just like with the march, march to the sea in Georgia, they are greeted by jubilant, cheering crowds of newly freed slaves. And then, much to everyone's shock, a figure appears among the ruins of Richmond. And it is Abraham Lincoln himself, having taken a carriage from Washington, made the trip in a few hours. He gets out of his carriage and walks the streets of the defeated, captured Confederate city. He is mobbed by crowds of African Americans, former slaves who are trying to touch him. In fact, one woman kneels in front of Abraham Lincoln and he, he picks her up. He says, no, 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 I'm sorry, ma'am. You don't kneel to a man. We only kneel to one person and to him on Sundays. Because Abraham Lincoln wants to see what happened. He wants to see the freed people himself. And he wants to assure the defeated Confederates that this is going to be a time for healing, not vengeance. Robert E. Lee attempts to run. This is the final chase of the Army of Northern Virginia, hotly pursued by the Army of the Potomac. It lasts for six days, April 3rd uh, to April 9th, 1865. Robert E. Lee takes off across the Virginia countryside, desperately trying to make it to the hills of the western parts of North Carolina, and then maybe some sort of final holdout there. He flees and fights a series of running battles as he retreats across southern Virginia uh, with the Union Army hot on his tails, and he moves from place to place to place, and then finally, at a railroad crossing called Appomattox, his tired and beaten troops. Again, most of them don't even have shoes. Their uniforms are falling apart. Some of them don't even have weapons anymore. 
But at Appomattox Crossing, he, he reaches the top of a hill and they realize, arrayed in front of him, the cavalry army of General Sheraton. He's been outflanked by the Union cavalry. And Lee has to make a very tough decision, another very tough decision. If he decides to punch through Sheridan's cavalry, he's got to drop his army. He's got to put them in battle formation. He's got to make sure that most of the people have guns and ammunition. And then he's got to try and push and attack Sheridan's army. That's going to take two or three days. And he's going to fight a battle. That's going to take a fourth day. And then he's got to put his army back together after this battle. They just don't have time. Grant is less than a day behind them. And now we have this cavalry in front of them. Lee's soldiers come to him and they start preparing for a last final stand. They're like, we are with you, General Lee. We are with you to the end. And they start drawing up plans for concentric circles of soldiers because there's no point in attempting to retreat anymore. And Lee sees them preparing for the last stand of the Army of Northern Virginia. And he can take no more. He sends a message to Ulysses S. Grant asking for terms of final surrender. On April 9th, 1865, they meet at the Appomattox Courthouse and finalize the surrender of the last great Confederate army. Robert E. Lee is in his dress uniform. Ulysses S. Grant arrives from the field <laughs> wearing the kit of a private with only the general stars on his overcoat. And they accept the final surrender of the Confederate army. And even though he has just saved their lives, Many of the soldiers cry out to General Lee, say it ain't so, say it's not, say it ain't so. But he says no. And he issues the orders for the flags to be furled and the weapons to be stacked and to, for them to surrender themselves to the Union Army. And despite all that they've done and all that they've suffered, shoeless, without weapons, haven't eaten for days, in tattered, crumbling uniforms, the last soldiers of the Army of Northern Virginia cry in sorrow as they surrender. The Civil War is over. Everyone knows it. Here's these newspapers, the surrender of General Lee, the year of Jubilee has come. Let all the people rejoice. 200 guns will be fired. You'd, you'd think they'd had enough of that. Richmond Falls, the war is over. The Civil War has ended. Only a handful of miles from the final surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia is Edmund Ruffin, the great fire eater who argued that the Civil War was a good thing and that it had to happen. The fire eater who had fired one of the first shots of the Civil War, firing a cannon at Fort Sumter. Edmund Ruffin is staying at the house of, uh, I think, one of his daughters, he plays with his grandkids in the morning. He goes upstairs. He puts a rifle in his mouth. Edmund Ruffin kills himself. Abraham Lincoln has preserved the Union. Abraham Lincoln has destroyed the great sin of American slavery. And Abraham Lincoln emerges as one of the greatest presidents in American history. Somebody who inherited a nation in deep, deep crisis, fixed the problems that existed, solved the crisis, and left the country in a much, much better position than, when it was, than where it was when he found it. And his greatest contribution isn't necessarily winning the Civil War or finding a general that could beat Robert E. Lee. Probably... It's not even the Gettysburg Address. Probably the greatest contribution of Abraham Lincoln is the 13th Amendment, passed January 31st, 1865. It's very simple. It's a single sentence. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist in the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. <laughs> 
American slavery took more than 70 years to build in the 1600s. It took a terrible war to destroy, and it is gone forever. Abraham Lincoln is not just one of the greatest leaders in American history. He might even conceivably have been one of the greatest Americans to have ever existed. He is, of course, murdered on April 15th, 1865, shot in the back of the head by John Wilkes Booth at close range. The First Lady, Mary Todd Lincoln, is sitting next to him and watches this happen. And as the president slumps forward, blood pouring from the gunshot wound in the back of his head, her mind snaps. She never really recovers her sanity. She stands up and begins to simply shriek and shriek and shriek. It falls to a young actress named Laura Keene, who sweeps into the president's booth and attempts to use her own dress to staunch the president's massively bleeding head wound. His soldiers pick, take him to a nearby boarding house where he's too tall to fit into any of the beds. They lay him out diagonally, but... You don't come back from being shot like that. You don't really come back from that at all. And Abraham Lincoln dies the next day. He dies before the final end of slavery inside the United States. And this takes place in Texas, where a lot of slaves had been moved to keep them away from the Union Army, to keep them away from Edmund Davis and William Sherman and Ulysses Grant. Texas formally surrenders to General Gordon Granger, who takes possession of the city of Galveston in June of 1865. And there he issues General Order Number 3, applying both the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment to the last American slaves in Texas. The city of Galveston erupts into jubilation. And of course, he does this on June 19th. Juneteenth, the final end of American slavery. The Civil War is over, and American slavery has been destroyed forever, but at a terrible, terrible price. The human cost of the war was simply staggering. 620,000 deaths, 620,000 Americans die in the, in the Civil War. That's almost more deaths than every other military conflict in American history combined. There are over a million wounded veterans, more than 60,000 amputees. One third of all Southern men were killed. One sixth of all Northern men were killed. For decades afterwards, both in the big cities and the small towns of the North and in the South, every town had an artificial limb shop where the veterans could get new limbs, they could get their existing prosthetics modified or repaired. They learned entirely new ways how to do things. One of the most popular classes of the period was left-hand penmanship. Disabled, but not disheartened for soldiers and sailors who lost their right arms in the war. And now they have to learn to write with the left. The military takes control of the South. The South is divided into five military districts with a different general in charge of each one. The one exception was uh, Tennessee, uh, which never went through military reconstruction because A, it was conquered uh, super early in the war and B, the president was from Tennessee, and he more or less offered asylum to everyone in Tennessee. And what the military wants to do with the old Confederacy, they want to militarily reconstruct the South, fix the South, and make it a more racially just place to fix the racism, to abolish the stigma of slavery, to enforce the 13th Amendment and the other federal laws that are about to happen, to make sure that African Americans can have all of the civil rights that the Constitution has promised to protect. But the biggest problem with Reconstruction is the President of the United States. President Andrew Johnson does not like any of these ideas about Reconstruction, and he vetoes bill after bill after bill. He's such an obstacle to Reconstruction 
that the radical Republicans in Congress actually try to impeach him on this trumped up thing called the Tenure of Office Act. It ultimately fails, but basically, you know, every single bill going through Congress, they'll have a bill, Andrew Johnson will veto it, they will override his veto, he will fume at them. They'll pass a new bill, Andrew Johnson will veto it, they will override his veto, and he will fume at them. But Andrew Johnson can do one thing that they can't stop. He can issue presidential pardons. And presidents can do this, and a lot of people don't know this. Basically, anyone who is convicted of anything can go to the president and ask for a pardon. And the president can give anyone a pardon. Now, most presidents, you know, generally pardon between about one or two or sometimes 300 people. It's generally done very low key. And it's generally done when someone is like obviously innocent or there are, you know, extenuating circumstances and, and you know, the processes of justice are simply too slow. Andrew Johnson issues 12,000 pardons. He doesn't even meet the people. All right, he issues blanket amnesties for entire cities. He issues pardon after pardon after pardon. He pardons almost all of these old Confederate generals. He, he pardons most of the senior members of the Confederate government. He gives an amnesty to Robert E. Lee, even though he doesn't actually pardon him. Perhaps most outrageously, Andrew Johnson issues a pardon for Nathan Bedford Forrest, the man who murdered 300 American soldiers at Fort Pillow absolutely outrageous. And when 1868 comes and goes, it takes Andrew Johnson with it, and everyone tries to forget about him. Ulysses S. Grant becomes elected president, and he is president for the next eight years. And I want you to look at this map of the election of 1868 and note the states uh, that you know, U.S. Grant won. The states in gray, of course, are the states that are still being militarily reconstructed, so they don't get the vote. But look, Ulysses S. Grant wins Louisiana. He wins Florida. He wins Tennessee, North Carolina, Alabama. Ulysses S. Grant wins South Carolina. So here's your big question. How is this Republican, the leader of the Union armies, the man who crushed the Confederacy, how is he getting so many votes in these southern states? And the answer should be obvious. African Americans are voting in massive numbers for these early Republican candidates, and especially voting for Ulysses S. Grant. Hell yeah, they're going to vote for the man who destroyed the Confederacy. And you have the first African-American politicians in Congress. You have black mayors, you have black governors, you have black congressmen, and all of these guys are Republican. And there's Edmund Davis, you know, the hero of our ethical dilemma. Edmund Davis becomes the reconstruction governor of Texas, even though a ton of people in Texas totally hate him. And together with a group of other African-Americans, including Joshua Houston, the man who took Sam Houston's last name, they found the Republican Party of Texas, founded by a scalawag and an ex-slave. Yeah, it's true. However, in the brutalized South, the old Confederates are simply not willing to accept a society of racial equality. In fact, racism actually increases in the years following the Civil War, as many white Southerners simply come to blame African Americans for the death and destruction of the Civil War. This was a war about slavery, and you got your freedom, and now I've got one leg and half my cousins are dead, and I'm impoverished. That's the level of bitterness that gets leveled against African Americans. Racial violence begins to explode across the South, and it's kept in check only by the presence of the US Army. And you can see this illustration right up above. You've got the angry white people on the left. In fact, one of them is wearing a cavalry, ca a cavalry cap from the Confederate Army. And uh, on the right, you have the African Americans standing up to them. And you'll please note that that one guy right there is wearing a Union Kepi, indicating that that's a Union veteran right there. And standing in between the two groups, a United States Army officer. 
and the army is actually more sympathetic to the African Americans than it is to the white Southerners. Because, and you see this over and over again during this Reconstruction period, that, you know, these racist Southerners will come up and they'll see a white army officer and they'll be like, how dare you defend that black man against me? And you have these army officers will look at these guys and be like, you want me to turn that guy over to you? That guy, that guy saved my life at the Battle of Chattanooga. That guy was my comrade in arms. What's more important than the color of the skin was the color of the uniform that man wore. He's an honored veteran. You're a damn rebel and a traitor. The U.S. Army is on the side of the black Americans. But racism continues to spread in the Reconstruction South. And in an effort to intimidate and control these new African-American voters, former Confederates, including the murderer of Fort Pillow, Nathan Bedford Forrest, form a secret organization known as the Ku Klux Klan. It's a secret organization dedicated to voter suppression, political violence, political terrorism, racism, and it basically is an attempt to turn back the clock, to reverse the Civil War. President Grant, as a president, is a very mixed bag. His presidency is plagued with scandal, plagued with mismanagement. But one of the things that Grant does do is he signs into law the Klan Act of 1871, giving the U.S. Army the power to pursue, arrest, and detain anyone who violates the civil rights of any U.S. citizen. This unleashes the military against the Ku Klux Klan in the South and he directs the U.S. military to attack the Ku Klux Klan, and they do this. The, the American cavalry, like, chases the Klan through the woods of the Mississippi. But the secretive nature of the Klan makes their suppression very difficult, and some of these guys, they can't prosecute for crimes they committed in the Civil War, because freaking Andrew Johnson pardoned them. But basically, this is Grant's plan. As long as the army is present in the South, it will protect the civil rights of these new American citizens. It will protect the civil rights of African Americans, as long as the army stays in the South. Then comes the election of 1876. The election of 1876 is probably one of the ugliest and most corrupt elections in American history. Even to this day, we don't really know who won the election of 1876. It was divided between the Republican candidate, Rutherford B. Hayes, and the Democratic candidate, Samuel Tilden. It was a, an election characterized by corruption, ballot stuffing, mysterious ballots appearing, all of these things that we generally associate uh, with a super corrupt third world country. We don't really know who won the election. But what we do know is who was president at the end of it. No one knows who won the election. It looks like the decision to become, uh, the decision to elect the president is going to go into the House of Representatives. When the southern states approach the Republican, Rutherford B. Hayes, and they approach him with a deal. They say, hey, look, Rutherford. We will stab our own candidate in the back, Samuel Tilden. We will stab him in the back, and we will award you the electoral votes of three southern states, Louisiana, Florida, South Carolina. That will make you the president. Do you want to be president, Rutherford B. Hayes? Rutherford B. Hayes nods. He really wants to be president. But you have to do something for us. And this becomes known as the Compromise of 1877, one of the darkest chapters in American history because the Southerners say, we will stab our own candidate in the back. We will give you the electoral votes of three Southern states. We will make you president if you agree to pull the army out of the South. Many Republicans are completely outraged at even the suggestion of this. The army is completely apoplectic. And they're like, how can you do this? How can you even consider this, Rutherford? Who names their kid Rutherford? How can you even consider this? You, of course, what, what did you tell them? Of course, what did you tell them, Rutherford? And Rutherford B. Hayes told them yes. 
and Rutherford B. Hayes is elected president in 1876. He becomes president and his first act is to pull the army out of the South. And then he passes a law called Posse Comitatus, 1878. And Posse Comitatus means that the U.S. military cannot arrest anyone within the boundaries of the United States. It strips the U.S. military of any ability to enforce law. It repeals the Klan Act. And the North is outraged. The people who fought for years, they attempted to reconstruct the South. They went, they went to the mat for their fellow veterans in the South and their mouths are just filled with the taste of ash. And you have some salty, salty political cartoons coming out of the Compromise of 1877. Look, there's a cartoon right up above me, and look at the level of salt in this cartoon. The American flag, tattered, flies upside down. A crippled Union soldier hanging his head in shame, shaking the hand of a swaggering Confederate who has his boot on the grave of a Union soldier, and the gravestone reads, in memory of the Union heroes who died in a useless war. And behind the swaggering Confederate, a black family being placed in chains, and Lady Liberty is weeping at the grave. That is a salty political cartoon titled the compromise with the South. There we have another political cartoon in the lower left. The Ku Klux Klan shaking hands with the racist White League and the Democratic Party with the banner inscribing the Union as it was. You're returning the South to the years before the Civil War. And the newly freed slaves being placed in a condition under a skull and crossbones that reads, worse than slavery. So here's the question. Did they betray the legacy of Abraham Lincoln? And if so, who did it? Who betrayed the legacy of Abraham Lincoln? Or are they trying to do too much too quickly? Did those Union heroes die in a useless war? Because without the army, all the old Confederates take control of their states. And this is a generation of politicians that are known as the Bourbon Democrats. They're called the Bourbon Democrats because of their, they're likened to these, uh, these kings in France called the Bourbons. And it's been said about the Bourbon kings that they forgot nothing and they learned nothing because the Bourbon Democrats basically are all old Confederates, all right? They were, for the most part, the old pre-war Cotton Kingdom oligarchy. They were the secessionists. They were the fire eaters. They were the Confederates. And they basically tried to pretend that the Civil War never happened. Instead of slave codes, they produce black codes. They create these crazy laws on vagrancy, arrest people for not working on Saturdays. And because they've been convicted by law, they can be placed in these basically prison labor forces that are little different than slavery. They strip African-Americans of their votes. They strip African-Americans of most of their civil rights. By 1885, all 11 states of the old Confederacy have governors who served in the Confederate Army, including the governor of Georgia is the former vice president of the Confederate States of America, um, Alexander Stevens. Incredible. And this is one of the things that many historians have pointed out, that the Confederates lost the war, but then they won the peace. And a rough deal is slowly worked out between the federal Republicans and the Bourbon Democrats. Basically, the North is absolutely sick of the South. They're absolutely sick of the South. By 1880, they've been dealing with all of the crap for the South has been throwing up for three decades. 
They fought a civil war. And the North is like, you guys lost the civil war. All right. And you're still, you know, trying to recreate slavery. We've got three constitutional amendments saying you can't do that. And finally, the North is like, look, 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 we're sick of you guys. We're absolutely sick of you guys. Is this really, is this really what you want? You want to be poor. You want to be uneducated. You want to be backwards. You want to build this sort of new slavery in the South. And this, what are you calling these laws? Jim Crow? Is this really what you want to do? The rest of the country is going to leave you behind. But you really want to be poor and ignorant and racist? And the South says, yes, this is exactly what we want. And that's exactly what the South became backwards, underdeveloped, violent, corrupt, and racist. And that's what it is for the next hundred years. And this spurs the greatest internal population movement in American history, a movement that has become known as the Great Migration. As many of uh, many African American families, they make the decision they're not going to live in the land of Jim Crow. They can't take the casual brutality and casual humiliations of the Jim Crow South, of this world that the Bourbon Democrats, the old Confederates, built to replace slavery. That is marginally not even better than slavery. They flee the South in large numbers. Somewhere between six and eight million African Americans leave the South in these huge out-migrations. Uh, people from Georgia and the Carolinas end up on the East Coast. People from Tennessee, Mississippi end up in the Midwest. People from Louisiana and Texas end up on the West Coast. And this creates one of the weird kind of settlement disparities with African Americans in the United States, which is to say, in the South, African Americans tend to live in the countryside and in small towns. But outside of the South, and especially in the North, African Americans tend to live in distinct communities inside really big cities. And that's a pattern, that's a settlement pattern that continues to this day. Because it's going to take an entire new generation of leaders that are going to tear down Jim Crow, that are going to pick up the tools left by radical Republicans during Reconstruction, and truly establish a racially just, I shouldn't say that, a more racially just society in the South. They are going to embrace the legacy of Abraham Lincoln and finish the job of Reconstruction. But that is way beyond the scope of this class. But you should have all the information you need. You should have all the information you need to answer that question right up above my head. Was the American Civil War the final triumph of liberty over slavery or a national tragedy of a failed political and economic system? Examine the outbreak and conduct of the war from one of these two perspectives. Was the war inevitable? Could Lincoln have won without resorting to total war? Was all of the death and destruction visited on the South justified? Does the messy post-war period change your perspective. I am eager to read what you write as an answer. And when you do so, when you do answer that question, I will see you there.